Is anybody here like amusement parks? Show of hands. You like amusement parks. You like rides. You like the thrill. You like roller coasters. You like, you know, spinning rides, things like that. I'm not good at that stuff. I, I, I can't. I never was. I probably never will be. Um, I'm scared of heights to begin with, so roller coasters and things like that don't, don't, don't sit well with me. Um, spinny things just make me super sick and dizzy, so I can't do it. But um, every now and again, like, I'm always, like, the, I'm the type of person that's, like, I have to try something once. So if I see a ride that I'm, like, okay, I don't think I've ever tried a ride like that, I'll try it once just to say that I've done it. And most likely, more often than not, I won't like it, won't do it again. But I have this rule. i got to try everything once. And I remember... Um, uh, last year, uh, we were at this fair in, in, in Vancouver. We were, we were on vacation, and I was with my niece. And she's like, oh, uh, Dano. She, she calls me Dano. My, fam- my family and friends call me Dano. She's like, Dano, uh, take me on this ride. And, and I looked at it, and I was like, oh, you know, it's a kid ride. She can go on it. Not a big deal. It just, you know, goes up and down and spins. And it's, uh, you know, not a big deal. But here's the problem is that, like, we just got to the fair. And I was looking forward to trying the different venues of food. Like, because I'm a foodie, I just go to events for food. I come over to your house just for food. And of course, to see you and hang out with you too. But, but, but I love food. Food is, is one of my love languages. And uh, now people are like, don't invite Danny over. He'll eat all my food. Oh, no, it's, I come for you too. But uh, I, I, so should we, we get to the fair and, I, and I'm looking forward, not to the rides or anything like that. I'm looking forward to the food, the different things that you get to try, the different venues, see what's new, see what I haven't tried yet. And, and, and my niece is like, oh, let's go on the ride. Please, please, let's go on the ride. And I'm like, okay, fine. So, so we, uh, we, we pay. We just got to the fair. We pay, the, you know, the, the tokens to get into the ride. And, and we start. And it's like, okay, it's not too bad. You know, we're, we're going up and down. And all of a sudden, it starts spinning. And all of a sudden, your chair starts spinning around in circles. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, I... I'm starting to feel sick. This isn't good. The, the, it was getting to me. I, I was feeling dizzy and nauseous. And all of a sudden, you know, we're, we're finally done. And, uh, and I get off, and I'm just, like, stumbling and trying to look for, like, the closest garbage can. And I'm like, oh, my big mistake just ruined my night at, at the fair because now I'm going to feel sick for the rest of the time. I don't want to eat food. This is horrible. Why am I feeling this way? Why did I agree to do this? Why didn't I, I know myself? I shouldn't have done this. Bad decision, but I did it just to please my niece. And I feel like that's a good picture of what it's like in everyday life that we make one wrong choice or one bad decision or one circumstance or one thing happens and it kind of just affects the rest of our day. It kind of just affects the rest of our morning or, or, or the, the rest of the day at work. One bad encounter, one coffee spill. I had my coffee spilt this week and I was just so upset because I spent all this time making it and, and doing this latte and, and, and making it all delicious and, and whatnot and I take it in, in, in my cup and I go to work and I get out of my car and I spill it. And I was just like, oh man, if that wasn't bad enough, I get out of the car and I'm walking with my cup and you know, coffee spilt on me and then I slip on the ice. And I'm like, can this day get any worse? <laughs> my feelings are starting to you know, get really angry now. I'm starting to get angry and, and frustrated. And, and not only that, I, I, I forgot my keys. I didn't have my keys to my office, so I got to go and ask the secretary to help me uh, get into my office. And things were just going so wrong. And I, and I remember sitting, finally getting at my desk and sitting down and finally just being like, Danny, you have a choice today. You can choose to be happy or you can choose the experiences that you just went through to dictate how the rest of your day is going to go. You have the choice to be joyful or to be upset and frustrated and miserable and sit at your desk and not have a good day at work and be grumpy to the people that come and encounter you or be grumpy to your your wife when you get home or you just want to be alone or you just want to, you don't want to talk to anyone. See, I want to talk to you tonight on the subject of your soul. Your soul. Everybody knows that we have a body, a soul, and a spirit. But what is your soul? Your, your soul is your every being. We are living souls. We, we experience emotions and feelings. And, and, and these are always changing. Depending on circumstances. Depending on, you know, what's going on around you. We're in a constant state of change. But see, a person who allows their soul to control their life is never at rest. 
This person, they're constantly just being led by their emotions, led by their feelings. Let me tell you something. If I was led by my feelings and my emotions, I'd probably be living in a hut on the coast of Costa Rica right now because I would have just given up with life and just said, you know what, screw it. Going to, uh, you know, selling everything, I'm going to go live in a hut and just live off the beach. Because, and you don't understand how many times Allison has talked me out of it because she doesn't base things off her emotions and feelings. Well, I do because I'm constantly changing, constantly on this roller coaster ride of life, uh, on this emotional roller coaster of my feelings going up and down and something happens and I'm like, oh my goodness, it's the end of the world. Let's, let's, let's leave, let's change. I need a new job, I need, I, I need new clothes, I need a new wardrobe, I, I need a new car. My car started making a funny noise. Oh no, it's broken. Buy something new and I'm, I, and I'm, I'm, a type, I'm the type of person that's very led by, 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 by my emotions if I allow it to be. And I constantly have to remind myself who's in control and who does my soul rest in and where do I find peace and who do I find peace. And uh, I want to talk on this subject, and it's very important to me because, like I said, I, I, I've struggled with this before. I've struggled with not being able to control my emotions and not being able to control my feelings and my thoughts. Before, I was the type of person that bottled everything inside. I don't know how many of you guys are like that. We bottle everything inside and we try to make it seem like everything's okay all the time or that we're strong and that we got it all together or that, you know, things don't affect us. Or sometimes when people speak ill about us, we, we, we say, oh, it doesn't affect me. Really, deep down inside, it does. It hurts our soul. It breaks our soul. And we carry that burden. We just sang about it. We carry that burden. But the word says, the Bible says, that you weren't meant to carry that burden alone, that you can give it to Jesus. And we're going to talk about that tonight. So my soul is, is earthly. This is the difference between your soul and your spirit, is that your soul is earthly, but your spirit is godly. It connects you to God. It's what connects you to the Father. It's what gives you communication with God, what Jesus did for us on the cross, reconciling our sins with God. So now we can have communication and that's our spirit. But our soul is earthly. But see, here's the thing, is that it was not designed for us to carry it alone. We weren't designed to get through it on our own. We look, let's look at the, at the garden in, in, in Genesis with Adam and Eve. It says they, they were there and, 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 and they didn't know, you know, God said what? Don't eat from the tree of, from the tree of, Good and evil, right? The soul, they, uh, how, how to differentiate what's good and what's, and what's evil. One person reads their Bible. Thank you, Jasmine. <laughs> and, and, and see, at that time, they had relationship with God. God's spirit was there. It says that, this, that, that, that his spirit hovered around. And, and, and so they, they communicated with God. And they didn't have any burdens. They didn't have any, anything that they had to carry. They had everything. God provided everything for them. They were just to live and, and, and have communion with God. But then they fell and sin came into the world and it separated them from God. And now they were conscious of what was going on. They experienced emotions and feelings. They began to experience things that they haven't experienced before. They, the woman realized that they were, and the man realized that they were naked. Adam and Eve realized that they were naked. They didn't know that before. They were designed to carry it alone. Our soul was never meant to live outside of God. But we see this happen from the very beginning, how it, we were never created to have, be outside of God. But sin separated us from God. But what did Jesus do? He came and reconciled us so that we can have communion. Now we have a soul that we experience these things. But what happens when we have, we're, we're heavy burdened and our soul feels heavy? When we are going through these roller coasters of life and we experience all these emotions and pains and, 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 and we grieve and, and we experience loss, frustration and anger and hurt, what do we do? What do we hold on to? How do we make sure that our soul is at rest, that our soul is at peace, that our soul is well? See, with our body, we can go and, and, and we can choose to eat better food. We can go on certain diets that, that improve our health. We can go on certain, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, you know, plants to, to, to do physical activity that help our body, that help our heart, that help our, uh, our, 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 you know, muscles and things like that. It's, it, it, our body is easy to, to, to maintain. If we do a good job, we can take care of it well. We can live a long life. 
But our soul, how do we take care of our soul? How do we make sure that our soul is doing well? And not just well, but thriving. See, with our spirit, we, can, we feed our spirit by reading the word, by, by doing our devotions, by spending time with God. But our soul is so important that it's, that, that it's doing well. So we have an enemy, though, who doesn't want. He can't, see, here's the thing. The enemy can't control your spirit. But your soul, he can do things to affect your soul. He can do things that will, you know, Make it so that you're, you're frustrated and you feel angry that you, 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 he, he's, he's a deceiver. He'll try to deceit you into, in, into feeling that, like, what you're doing is wrong. Or, and he'll bring shame and he'll bring condemnation. He'll bring, he'll, he'll bring things into your life that will make you feel like you're unworthy of God's love. Like you're unworthy of, of his presence. Like you're unworthy to come to church. You shouldn't come to church. See, th- those things, because your soul is earthly, he has access to. But your spirit, he does not. He cannot take your spirit away from God. But see, here's the question. How does God see your soul? How does God see your soul? I want to talk to you about a couple of individuals in the Bible. And I'll start with, with David. King David was a man who, who, who God describes as a man after his own heart. David, he, he, he rose to prominence at a young age. And he was destined to, to do great things. And he began to, to, to encounter trial after trial after trial. And if you begin to read the Psalms, the Psalms is just like a, a, an opening into David's life, a glimpse into David's life of, of the different emotions and feelings and the things that he went through. Just read the Psalms and you'll hear David's heart. You'll hear, you'll hear how, how depressed and how anxious and how stressed he was. You'll hear about how he, he, he faced many trials and how he couldn't control of what was going around him, what was going inside of him, what he was feeling, his thoughts, his mind. He couldn't control it. So he continually had to give it to God. He continually had to meet with God and find a, a, a rest in his soul with God. He continually had to anchor himself into God to make sure that his soul was, was okay. You have someone like Elijah who, Faced so much adversity, faced so much uh, persecution in the time uh, that, that he was alive. He was con- constantly fighting against people who were defying the name of, of God. They were raising up false idols and Elijah was, was, was bring, breaking them down through the help of God and the Spirit. But he, was, he experienced severe stress and emotions and depression. But what did he do? God continued to remind him that he was with him. God continued to remind him that he was for him. And God had to continue to remind him if he was for him, who could be against him? And you have someone like Daniel who was in the lion's den. Imagine what Daniel must have been feeling in that moment, being in in a den with lions, knowing that at any minute he could be devoured. The emotions, the feelings, the things that he was experiencing but he trusted in God. He leaned on God. Now let's look at Jesus. See, Jesus was fully man, but fully God. He experienced emotions. He experienced feelings. We know this because we read in the Word. The Bible says that even Jesus, he he, he was facing so much stress, so much uh, anxiety before leading up into the crucifixion that he was even sweating blood. And, and, and there's, there's doctors who go and research, it's, actual, it's a real condition of being under severe stress, severe pressure. Jesus even felt emotions because even the time he said, God, if this is your will, take this cup from me now. God, I, I don't want to do this. But Jesus faced emotions and feelings. Jesus even wept when he saw his friend, Lazarus, dead. Even though he knew that he could speak life and he would be raised again, but he still experienced emotions and feelings like you and I. It still hurt when he went to the cross, everything that he went through, everything that he experienced for you and I. But there's three things that I want to talk to you tonight about. There's three things that that I see in, in, in just small portions of scripture that speak so much truth to you and I today. 
three things that I, I believe God wants to speak to you tonight and remind you that he is for you, that he hasn't forgotten about you, that he sees you. He sees the little things in your life. I know I get home and, and, and sometimes my wife is just so frustrated because she's trying to take care of this other human being as best as she can, but there's sometimes she doesn't know what's going on. She doesn't know, how, how, you know what this baby is needing. And she's trying different things and, and the stress and the motions play into effect. Am I doing a good enough job? And me as a husband, I'm like, am I being there enough? Am I at home enough? We go through this, these emotions, these feelings every single day in our life of, you know, am I a good employee? Am I a good friend? And stress comes, hey, these bills are piling up. Are we going to have enough? I, I, I got to work harder to provide for my family so we, we, have the, we face the pressure. Someone, you know, did something wrong to us and hurt us and we feel sad or broken or hurt. And these emotions, what do we hold on to? Where do we go? How do we make sure that our soul is okay? Well, some things that we can do, there's, uh, God has given so much wisdom and so much grace to individuals. And there's people that you can go see and that's, uh, that will help you with, you know, with mental health issues and things like that. You can go and talk it out. There's different things that you can, you, you can do to, to ensure that your, your mind is, is, is receiving health and, and but one of the things that I noticed with Jesus, and we get a glimpse into this conversation between Jesus and God, this only happens twice in, in the Bible. Jesus was constantly praying, constantly praying to God, but we never hear God speak in response immediately. But at these two instances, we see how God speaks to Jesus. We see how God, what God thinks of Jesus. We see how God talks to Jesus. And the first one was that in Matthew 3, 16, when Jesus is being baptized. And he comes out of the water. And what happens is the, the heavens open and the spirit descends on him like a dove. Let's read it. Matthew 3, I'm going to start from 16. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened. And he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son, whom I am, I love, and with, I am well pleased. This is amazing. This is a glimpse of God now speaking to, to Jesus. The second time is in the Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus meets with, with key people in, in, in the Bible, some of these people that we just talked about. I'm going to read it from Matthew 17, verse 5. It says, actually, I'll read the beginning. It says, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like sun, like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before him Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I'll put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them. This is God now. And a voice from the cloud said, this is my son, whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. Listen to him. This is God now speaking audibly about Jesus. This is God now revealing his love for his, his son. I believe this is a, a key indication of how God sees you and I as sons and daughters. How God sees you and I as righteous sons and daughters before him. The first thing I want to talk to you tonight about is acceptance. That you have been accepted. See, God says to you, this is my son, this is my daughter. You are my son. You are my daughter. You are accepted. Your emotions, your feelings, things that you're going through, it's okay it's okay to, be, to face these things, but know that no matter what you're feeling, you're still accepted. No matter what you're experiencing, you're still accepted. No matter what you're experiencing, God, oh, what you've done, God still accepts you for who you are. He sees you. He knows you. He knows that you can't do it alone. He knows that you weren't designed to do this alone, but you have already already been accepted. You've already been given grace. You've already been adopted into his family, and there's nothing that can separate you from that. God knows you're weak. God knows you struggle. Yet, 
in spite of that, he still accepts you. See, here's the thing is that in this society, in this world that we live in today, we're, we live in this age where it's like, you know, you got to be strong, you got to be tough. You, you, you got to show like you have it all together. Just look at people's Instagrams. It's all the highlights. It's all the good stuff. It's all the good things that are going on in their lives. Nobody posts, you know, me spilling my coffee or me falling on the ice. Selfie, fell on the ice. No one posts, you know, the stain that I had on my shirt for the rest of the day. Instead, we post the outfit of the day when you look good, right? When things are going well. But when things aren't going well, it's like, man, people don't like me. People, you know, people, they, they don't want to hang out with me. I'm not cool. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not funny. I'm nothing special. Why, you know, why I, I shouldn't be here? You know, I, I don't deserve, you know, friend, to have friends. I'm a mean person. I'm a horrible person. I should just be alone, locked up somewhere. But God doesn't see you that way. You may think that about yourself, but God doesn't think that about you. You may think that you're not worthy. You may think that you're, you know, that, that you're, you're weak, and that's okay to know that you're not weak, but know that you are strong in him. Because it's he who makes you strong. It's he that lifts you up. It's he that's already adopted you. It's he that's already accepted you just as you are. So what do you got to do? You just run and embrace being loved and being accepted by the Father. And knowing that what you're experiencing right now is temporary. It's momentary. But what you experience in God is, is life enduring. It's life changing, life altering. Knowing that you're accepted. People can, 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 can judge you. People can think wrong about you. But know that you've been accepted by the only opinion that actually matters. By the only judge that only matters. And that's God. And he sees you as accepted. He sees you as a son, as a daughter. The second thing is he shows you affection. He says, whom I love. This is my son whom I love. You know that you're a son and a daughter that God loves you? I know if you heard it before, but have you actually began to look at the whole picture of how deep and how wide God's love is for you? Let me put it into perspective. His son, he sent his son here just to die for you and I. Everything that he did was that so you can feel today knowing and live today knowing that you are loved unconditionally. Knowing that you are loved. Knowing that you are accepted. He shows affection towards you because he is a good father. That he, he gives you good gifts. That he gives you this life that he's just pouring blessing upon blessing over your life. That he takes care of you. That he's looking out for you. That he has his best interests for you because he knows that you are his son. That you are his daughter. And no matter what you can do, there's nothing that you can outrun. You can't outpace. You can't outhide God's love for you. He's chasing after you. He's, he's looking for you. He wants to meet with you. He wants to speak to you. You're not forgotten. You're a son. You've been accepted. He's showing love to you. You're, he's showing you affection. And these emotions and these feelings that we experience, we get lost. We need to be reminded that you've already been found. You've already been embraced. You've already been loved. So you don't, you don't, you don't have to continue carrying this alone. You don't have to continue walking this life alone. And the third thing that God does when he speaks with Jesus is he affirms him. He says, this is my son with whom, with him I am well pleased. Do you know that God is, is proud of you? He's so proud of you. Of who you are and who you become and, and the goodness that lives inside of you because his son lives inside of you. But here's the thing. Is that I, if, you, if you're anything like me, I'm, I'm, I'm this person who thinks that I have to have all the answers, but I don't. You don't. You and I don't have the answers. When our, when our kids are acting up and they're going crazy and you just don't know what to do, you don't have the answers. When things are going at work and things are, are stressed out and, and you're trying to meet deadlines and things are out of your control, you don't have the answers. And it's okay to admit that you don't have it all under control. It's okay to admit that you have defeat. 
But only when you know who's carrying you, who's in control. Only when you know that you have a savior to lean on. Only when you know that you have a savior that's looking after you. Only that you know that you, 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 you've given control and you said, God, I choose to follow you. I choose to connect my spirit to you so that you can continue leading me into the path that you have for my life. So instead of worrying, I pray. Instead of sitting down in defeat, I get up because he's picked me up, because he's carrying me. Paul says, because when I'm weak, you are strong. Because when you are weak, you are strong. Because it is he who lives in you. And he is greater than you. And when you begin to believe that and live that, things change. Circumstances change. I remember sitting at my desk and all these things were happening and I was just having a bad day. And I said, God, I don't want my earthly emotions and feelings to control me. I want your spirit to control me. I want your spirit to live in me. And your spirit brings what? Peace. Love, tenderness, compassion, kindness, gentleness, goodness. It brings the, uh, the different fruits. It brings the different gifts. And I allow him just to, uh, to work in my life. But how many of us are not willing to let go and give control? We like being the, the ones in control. The, we like being the, the heroes in our own stories when you weren't meant to be the hero of your story. You don't need to be the savior of your family. Your family already has a savior. His name's Jesus. You can only be the best mom and the best dad that you physically can. But ultimately, it's God who's leading you. Ultimately, it's God who, who, who makes me a better person. Ultimately, it's God and it's Jesus living in me who makes me a better son or a better father, a better husband. Because without him, without him, I, I, I know what my feelings want. I know what my selfish desires want. I'd rather just do my own thing. I'd rather just think about myself. I'd rather just, you know, live, live you know, just feeding Danny. But because when I made the decision to follow Christ, I decided to let things go and give him control and allow him to dictate my future, my path. And the more that I let go, the more God began to work in my life and the more compassion I began to grow for people, the more uh, uh, sensitivity I began to feel for other people's hurts and pains. The more I let go and the more I let Jesus dictate my soul, I found rest. I found peace. I found comfort. I found a home. I found a place where I don't need to worry about tomorrow because I know who's in control. I don't need to stress because my spirit is at rest. My soul is at rest. My mind is at rest. Because I have this relationship now with the Father through what Jesus Christ did for me that I know that he sees me as accepted. And I know that he's continually showing me his affection and his love and his blessings. And I know he's continuing to affirm me because I see uh, my life and, and, and the places that God has taken me and reaffirming things in my life that I need to just remind her of. I just need to be reminded of over and over again. See, I'm not, I'm not trying to preach to you tonight to try to make you feel good. This is not why we preach. We don't preach so that you can leave here feeling good. I preach to you so that you can know how awesome our God is and how awesome he, that he can be in your life. Because my goal isn't to make you feel good about yourself, to make you feel better about yourself. My goal is to point you to the one who's already done it all for you. My goal here is to point you to, to, to have a relationship with God, an intimate love, an intimate connection with him like never before. My goal isn't just to, so that you can leave feeling better about yourself, but instead saying, God, I need you even more in my life. I need more of your grace, more of your love. Because if we're basing everything just off of feelings and emotions, tomorrow you can come back and say, man, that message didn't work for me. Of course it didn't. But the relationship with God, it will. That's what it says, I have the, this anchor for my soul. If your soul isn't anchored in him, of course it's going to be moving. Of course it's going to be changing. 
Of course, we're going to be experiencing the stresses and, and, and feelings of this life that we face day in, day out, which aren't wrong. Of course, we're going to face trials. But when we have an anchor for our soul, it means that it's just going to blow by us, and we're just going to stay anchored and on the rock, and we're not going to be shaken. We're not going to be moved. That's what it means to find rest. Jesus says, take this yoke upon me, and I will give you rest. What he's saying is, give me what you feel is heavy, and I will carry it for you. What you weren't meant to carry, what you weren't meant to take on, I will carry it for you. There's things in our life that sometimes we're carrying that we don't need to be carrying. Things that we're stressing out about that we don't even need to be stressing out about because he's in control. You want to find rest, begin to search after his presence. And it's there that you'll find rest at his feet. There's things, there's decisions that you're worried about. At his feet is where you begin to find answers. You begin to find his presence and, and his way. And his ways are greater. His ways are stronger. His ways are higher than my own. I'm just going to ask uh, maybe Seth if he can just come and just come on the, the keys. I don't know about you, but lately I, I, I've... I've kind of just been experiencing some of, some of this firsthand where some things I've just been kind of getting out of, out of my hands, out of my control, and, and I'm trying to fix it, trying to do everything I can. I lose sleep, and it's okay. Any, anybody can go, go for it. <laughs> Anything, just, 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 just play quietly. We're just, just going to enter a time of prayer. And, and I, know, I noticed something. I noticed something that, that was missing in my life. See, I, I work here at the church full time. I work, um, you, know, you know, Monday to, to Thursday, well, Sunday to Thursday. And I'm in a church. It should be, you know, the best place to be able just to sit back and, and, and pray and reflect and, but you'd be surprised how often, <laughs> how little we, we, we find moments in our day to actually do that. And the busyness of life. And then I get home and, you know, I got to help out with the baby and I got to help out with, with Allison. And she wants some of my time and the baby needs some of my time. The dog always tries to sneak in there too and just try to take some time. And I have a niece who, 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 who looks up to me and wants some of my time and a sister who wants time and my family back home wants time and, and you know someone's sending me a message and they want time and someone else is going through something and they, they need my help or, and I'm being pulled in all these different places being pulled into different directions and I'm not saying this to complain because I know you guys are facing the exact same thing And I just felt like God speak to me and say, like, what are you doing? You were never meant to solve the world's problems. I already did. What your job is to do is to point them to me. But then I heard the Spirit speak so loud and so clear to me, say, but why aren't you running to me? You're telling everyone else to, you know, you need Jesus and you need, you need to spend more time in prayer. And say, what about you? And it kind of just, it's pretty convicting, actually. Because there was a few things. I'm just like, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to make this better. I don't know how to grow this or do that. It's exactly, you, you don't know. But I do. You can't do it, but he can. You don't have the answers, but he does. And I was like, oh man, like, I need to take a step back and just, just find some time just to be at his feet, just at his presence. And I remember I, just, I was able to escape for a little bit. And, and one of these songs came on of, uh, 
don't know if you guys heard the Israel Hooten song of like, to worship you I live. He says, before you're anything else, Danny, before you're a pastor, before you're a husband, before you're a father, before you're a cousin or an employee or a supervisor, before any of that, before any of the titles that you can give yourself, before whatever you, you think you are, just know that you're a son first. Just know that you're a daughter first of the God Most High. And if you can't get that right, you won't get anything else right. Learn how to enjoy being with God. Learn how to enjoy being with the Father. And the result of that, you will be a better husband. You will be a better father. Know how to be a son first, Hanny. And enjoy being in the presence of God and, and, and leaning and trusting in Him. And, and everything else will follow suit. 